Video journalist Sean Machen Tihig visited journalism students at the University of Limerick to talk about his unique and innovative way of storytelling. Using his knowledge of traditional Irish folklore and his capsule mobile journalism kit to produce some of the most memorable and effective human interest pieces for RTE and TG Cahar. Having 10 years experience covering regional, national and international news, he made quite the impression and taught students some valuable lessons for starting starting their careers. Um, so I'm, I'm from the, the Gaelic region in, in West Kerry, a place called uh, Dúm Chuyn, Palinotéric, where I grew up. Um, so as Mary was explaining, I work, I'm uh, works report with RT, I'm within the Nuacht division, the Irish language division of Nuacht which also provides news content for TG Cahat. It's, it's um, part of, um, uh, it's an RTE requirement to provide a certain amount of, of hours uh, TV every day to TG Cahar, so that's made up through its news service. So I also provide content then for the 6-1 news, 9 o'clock news, uh, news at one radio, online content. Um, as Mary was explaining, I work alone as, as a video journalist, I'm based out on the tip of the Dingle Peninsula, and I suppose the fact that I work alone um, accommodates that in the sense that it doesn't add any expense to RTE to have um, me working in such a remote area. So I, I tend to focus on the remote peninsular areas, West Cork, West Kerry, um, South Kerry, the Beira Peninsula, and so on. A lot of my stories are human interest stories, community driven stories, community issues, um, but also interesting characters. I tend to do, uh, I tend to enjoy doing a lot of stories about individuals who have interesting stories to tell. I am generally the last story in the bulletin. <laughs> um, so that might give you an idea of the kind of, um, the, 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 the area I, li I like working in. So um, today anyway, I'd love to kind of have a general chat about the work I do, how I approach it, um, we look at a couple of examples from elsewhere as well that I think uh, illustrate strong evidence of, of powerful storytelling and I'd like to explore that area a little bit as well uh, in terms of constructing stories and uh, not just for television but th th this would be relevant also to, to print journalism, to online media. St uh, approaching storytelling in a creative, imaginative way and how we can draw from traditional storytelling to create modern media content. So just to give you an idea um, how I work, I'm going to show you a couple of news packages. They're all only about, I think they're about a minute 50 each. So this is from the island of Kos um, and the reason I'm showing you this, I want to, I'd like you to take note maybe of the, the use of natural sound to enhance the telling of a story. And the natural sound kicks in towards the end of the report. You'll notice it. Um, I'll play it first and we can discuss it afterwards. <laughs> Clean-up and disinfection underway outside the Croatian refugee camp at Opatavas. Following chaotic scenes here in recent days, all is calm. But only because the major border crossings from Serbia have been closed. People are brought by bus from the border now, only as space becomes available. Just outside the little border village of Bobska, there are about 300 migrants and refugees waiting to be carried by bus to the refugee camp at Opatavac. They've come here across the Serbian border and they've been waiting for hours under the blazing sun. Abbas from Iraq pushes his 85 year old grandmother. What's her name? Uh, Their objective is shared by almost all here. Germany. You want to go to Germany? Yes. Karim and his family fled Damascus. They had been walking for 15 days. We have nothing. We have. Uh, we, we don't have home. We don't have. Uh, uh, we ha don't have work. We don't have anything. So we're all we are decided to travel to Europe to fill in some humanity here. I, I need to walk, I need to be able to get, uh, there's more people down there, I need to be able to get to everybody. Luigi Roditas came to Croatia from LA on holiday. He now does what he can to help. I, I don't know if it's be very popular, but a lot of us are very frustrated with some of the aid organizations that aren't being super proactive uh, um, 
passing out stuff. For example, the Red Cross has tons and tons of water down there, but they're not getting any of the water to these people here who are like 350, 400. A bus has just arrived here, and as you can see, the crowd are surging towards it. They fear it could be the last one, and panic has set in. Over 45,000 refugees and migrants have crossed into Croatia in the last eight days. Almost 9,000 came yesterday alone. As border crossings remain closed tonight, and numbers build on the Serbian side, the push for Germany is becoming literally just that. Sean McAteeg, RTE News, Obscat on the Croatian-Serbian border. Okay, so that's an example of, of um, essentially community story uh, focused on refugees and migrants. Um, I'll come back to some of the storytelling techniques and that in a while, but just to give you an example of another type of story, um, I find a, maybe a rural story. The sound of Sejan, do you want to put it I, I, so I think see. it's this one here. Is it in the back? So this would be kind of drawing from my folklore uh, background, um, a cultural story. I like doing a lot of these. Are you all familiar with the Blasket Islands? Yeah, the, the Great Basket was evacuated in '53. was six years old when the Great Basket was evacuated. He was the only child on an island devastated by emigration. When a journalist and a photographer visited in 1948, the little boy became the focus of international attention. And the headline that appeared in the paper then, the loneliest boy in the world, he was only a seagull was famous, which was very hilarious at the time, I'm sure. You know? it, was, it was syndicated all over the world. And I just, I just got presents. I just became a celebrity overnight. Well, no one to myself. The postman certainly knew about it as parcels flooded in from all over the world. Comics, cowboy books, clothes, uh, motor cars, every type of toy. Yeah, the in some end, I just make you think the mask cover, crazy, you ain't going in. But I grew up with all the people that were the youngest of the 30. You know, I thought I was as young, of all the seven, and they were the youngest of me. That, that's a, probably a paradox, is it? Following the, the, the older people around, doing all the duties that they, they were doing, I followed them. And it was boat building, sheep shearing, fishing. It was always there. Garod is one of only nine islanders alive today. The publication of his life story is a symbol of gratitude to the old men and women that gave him such affection. They were very protected of me. Protected of me. <laughs> They did, particularly at all times. I was very happy. Never felt lonely. Sean McAteeg, RTE News, Cork. Okay, that's a very different story. Um, a much more pleasant story, and uh, one focused on a certain cultural element, I suppose. So, how do I work? I work alone. Um, I have a mixture of equipment. So, I do a lot with the, the phone iPhone 6 Plus, just a simple clamp holder like this. I've got attachment mics then that I can plug in to improve the natural sound that I'm capturing. Obviously, you've got the phone mics, uh, but they can tend to, you know, you get a lot of distortion, especially if you're working in the wind or in a breeze. So um, attachment mics, which are quite, quite um, cheap as well to buy. Um, I think this one was about 60 euro. Um, and it gives it reasonably good quality. Little tripods, I can attach the, the, the iPhone onto this and it gives me a lot of flexibility in getting nice steady shots um, off a little tripod. I have a larger tripod that I use with my, my bigger camera. My bigger camera isn't that big, it's an EX, a Sony X3. It's much smaller, smaller than the standard broadcast cameras and that just allows you the flexibility of being able to carry all your own gear on your own. 
So I have a rucksack, I can carry my camera, uh, my radio mics, uh, batteries, my laptop for editing, I can carry everything in a, in a rucksack, and then my tripod. So you can carry everything you need to make television on your back. Uh, and it gives you a tremendous flexibility. Uh, for a start, you can always have your gear with you in the boot of the car, whatever, even if you come across something on a day off, you're there ready to go. Um, you, you can capture it immediately. Um, whereas if you're working like most report, TV reporters are, you're having to coordinate with the desk to source a cameraman to get the cameraman to come to you, and the whole thing could be over by the time everything gets organized. So there's great flexibility in it. Um, I tend to, because I, I've, sh I've shot quite a few packages completely, entirely on the phone, um, because I've got a, a bigger camera, I just tend to use that as well. Uh, you know, it gives you additional functions, zoom in particular, unless you get, uh, buy specific adapters for the lenses on the iPhones, you can't really use the zoom there because everything starts to get pixelated. So you need to get up close to the subject with uh, the iPhone. So its drawbacks are, for example, there was a story, uh, a pair of rare birds uh, arrived in West Kerry a few weeks ago. I couldn't shoot that in the phone because I couldn't get close enough, obviously, to the, the nesting area without disturbing them. Um, I needed to use my larger camera and use the, the full extent of the zoom there. The benefits, however, of the phone, especially working in rural areas, you're, you're not as invasive. You know, you're, you're, people aren't getting freaked out, you know, when a journalist arrives with a camera crew and big a load of gear and lights, some of these people might never have um, done an interview before for television, and it can be quite daunting. Interviews are daunting for us all, even even like I'm working with with cameras every day, and when the cameras turn to myself for piece to cameras, when I'm doing my own live links and that, I get nervous. It's just uh, it's just a natural reaction to to a, this alien piece of plastic and glass. We just, many of us just don't like cameras. There are others who absolutely love the camera, which is great. Um, so the way I work is, um, I have a clip that I can give you an idea. Basically, I source, I have the freedom to source the stories. I'm working in a region. I, I can select material that interests me, which is great. Some reporters work from the desk, work from the news editors they're asked to go out to cover certain things. There are certain things that have to be covered regardless. You know, if there's major press conferences, if they're obviously the, the politics, the doll sittings and that ha have to be covered. Whereas um, in, I, 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 I get a lot of freedom to, to source my own material. So naturally then you're going to be really interested in the story and you're going to kind of maybe go the extra mile to produce um, good content if possible. So um, in the morning, you make the pitch to the editors, they'll say yes, work away, or they'll say, do you know what, maybe find something else. Maybe we've got another similar story running today from another region, um, or they just might not be interested. There are certain editors who are interested in a certain type of story. Um, other ed editors then love a different, another type of story. So you're kind of juggling as well with the editors. You kind of might be holding back certain stories, <laughs> depending on the editor on duty. Um, but in fairness, the, all the editors I am, I'm working under, they, 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 they're fantastic, you know, they give me great freedom. So I have a little video here, I think I do, yeah. That'll give you a flavor, it's only about a minute long, of how I work. larger camera that I use, the X3. It's fully HD.
that's basically it. Um, it's very self-sufficient, you know. It's it's it's, and as I was saying, it, like there's great freedom in in that type of a work method. Um, the disadvantages, I suppose, working alone, especially when you're abroad, you know, it's it's always nice to have someone with you on on a, a trip, especially when you're kind of out of your comfort zone as well, going into new territories and that. Um, but I think the the benefits definitely outweigh the disadvantages. For a start, the amount of people I've come across, you know, you're looking for an interview with someone and they're declining because they're just too shy to go on camera, they've never done one before. And as you kind of try to persuade them, you end up explaining to them that you have a small camera that's in the boot or you have a phone. And you'd be surprised how, how people can be can finally decide to give it a go. Um, Quite often, I I might even offer. No, it's a last resort. I I'll, I'll offer to do the interview with them, and if they're unhappy with it, that I give them my word that I won't use it. Now, a lot of journalists would say, you know, ethically as a journalist, you shouldn't give someone editorial call if they're doing an interview. They're doing an interview, but it's better to have it than not get it. You know, so um, and that gives people peace of mind because you know you're you're approaching them as a stranger. And you know, there's only a certain uh, level of trust on a on a on a first impression or a first meeting. So and has that worked for you, Sean? Did you ever kind of do that if someone was shy? Oh, I have, and, yeah. And, and you let them have a look at it, and then they were fine. With it, yeah, no, I I I I wouldn't let them have a look at it. Yeah. What I, would you I do? discuss afterwards. Were you happy with that? All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because there's always a danger. I think we're all. When you show it to them. Yeah. We're all very conscious of our image Ourselves, and that, yeah. and you know yeah. that. You know, you you you. They might always be looking to improve it yes. as such. Yes. And know. then you have to go back. And yeah, and you know that you the yeah. content that that'll yeah. do them justice, and you're not going to do yeah. them a disservice. Yeah. That's the key thing. Um, the other thing is like you, some people, especially when we're working through the the medium of the Irish language for the reports, you know, they're Irish. They might be struggling with the Irish a bit, and you might have to kind of spend a bit of time, because you don't want to have someone looking looking bad. On national television, you know, if they're going to give up their time and their information to basically do you a favor, in a sense, as a journalist, and give you an interview, um, you have duty to do them justice as well. You don't want to put them out looking silly. Um, so, it's worth spending a little time, maybe working on the, on a couple of sound bites, um, or you know, until someone's really comfortable. You don't want the kind of rabbit and headlights uh, image of a person either. You know, so you need to relax them into the into the role so quite often if it's their if it's someone's first time being on camera being filmed for broadcast uh, i might do some of the setup shots initially you know some of the the sequences you know if they, let's say the potato farmer there now for example i'd start filming him in the field working and he's busy doing his work and i'm drifting around him and gradually he's be becoming more accustomed to the camera and to the attention and so on and by the time it comes to do the interview then he's a lot more relaxed so there's kind of small little simple techniques um, that can be used just to make the experience a lot better for the interviewee and also then to improve the content that you're capturing um, Where I'd find my hard drive here. Uh, I guess I get your idea. Um, he set you up, didn't he? He, he did. He did. Yeah. So, um, in terms of of news packaging or or even online content, I suppose from the whole perspective of storytelling, it's really important that you strike a, a certain rhythm and pace in the packaging. So. I suppose the biggest pitfalls are that you can have a huge lull in a report. Obviously, you want to grab someone's attention initially. You need a hook at the top of the package, so you need to kind of come in with a bit of a bang. And then as you're working your way through the package, if you can imagine waves, the package is going to have some troughs and then it's going to rise again. So you need to kind of sprinkle 
um, the, 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 the really attractive material throughout your package. And ideally, you need to finish with something that's strong, something that will, that will finish with, a, not with a bang if possible, you know, that, something that's memorable. So that might be a bit of natural footage, it might, be, um, it might be a line of script, it might be something really powerful from the interviewee. And I suppose the challenge is, every package is gonna fall down somewhere, you know. Now and again, you produce a package that kind of ticks all the boxes in terms of capturing someone's imagination. Thanks, Nina. Um, so for example, for me, now by the way, I'm not holding these up to be great reports or anything. They're just a few examples of the type of work I do. Um, a lot of them have, uh, you know, f flaws, um, but there are certain elements that I, the reason I've selected them is for specific elements. The first package there on the, the, the refugee situation in Croatia, for me, the powerful <coughs> element of that was the audio towards the end. And I think there was, I, w I remember going back over, there was about 15 to 20 seconds of no script, no interview. That rarely happens in news packaging for TV because you're limited in time, your packages are about a minute 40, minute 50, you're trying to get as much information into that minute 40, 50 as possible. So I suppose the, the inclination is there to try and shove as much information into it. Yet what you were trying to, the story you were trying to tell, you were trying to impact upon the viewership at home. And I think by letting it breathe, letting the viewer drift into the story through the actuality and through the natural sound and the shouting is actually a lot more beneficial than me cramming in a load of statistics about the current crisis in terms of how many migrants came in last week. I could go into four, four or five lines of script to fill that last sequence. I think there was three lines of script. I could have filled it wall to wall with script and it loses its impact completely because what you want to do is get across the human story. Um, while we're talking about storytelling, I'll just show you a couple of different approaches, very different approaches. The first is a piece produced by the New York Times. Um, an awful lot of research went into this. It's a pretty dry topic. They're talking about the, the issues with the subway. Um, and there's a lot of historic information, a lot of archive in it, but I think the way they tell it is, is superb. I'll show you just maybe two minutes of this. I, I think it's a 12 minute situation in, 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 in its entirety. The city is awake. Across the length of its five boroughs, a vast stream of humanity will move. This was what a New Yorker's commute looked like in 1961. Can be seen the daily miracle that is the New York City transit but system. That was then. Convinced. And this is now. Subway now has the worst on-time performance of any major rapid transit system in the world, and commuters are pissed. This woman's commute has gotten so bad, she's considering leaving a job she really likes. No, I, uh, I got a new job. This rabbi was sent into a panic when his train stalled just before Shabbat. And then there's this guy, who was stuck underground for so long, commuters saying to pass the time. God won't make me lose my mind. Up in two hours. They ended up making a Facebook group. They're still in touch. Yeah. The mornings where every single line is delayed. It feels like cruel or arbitrary. It's like, oh, no, it's so no. But it really wasn't that long ago that New Yorkers would laugh at other city subway systems. Four lines in Boston, two in LA. That's cute. In New York, our trains run 24 7. We have 665 miles of track, 472 stations. 27 subway lines and almost 6 million riders every single day. Does it really have to be this bad? Also, has it always been this bad? Turns out the MTA has recovered from a transit crisis before. These were the trains of the 1970s. Poor maintenance, high crime, widespread repeat. It was kind of scary. And that's Jim. He's been reporting on the subway since before I was born. He wasn't both of that.
the 70s it was really really bad maintenance release had suffered so officials poured money into the system and it improved they are working on it they're doing the best they can they're fixing the track well, they're too. fixing the track they put in a new escalator downstairs move it in the 80s today we got better equipment better parts and better tools it gets to be kind of the best it's ever been. The 1990s were the golden era of subway functionality. If you want to prove to someone that New York has it all, just show them your metro card goal. New York's governor at the time, George Pataki, called it a transit renaissance. But then that city that has, has it, all. it all started taking the system for granted. Starting with Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Cut down the size of city government. Just a year into his first term, the mayor cut the city's contribution to the MTA budget by millions of dollars. Then, Governor Pataki followed Giuliani's lead. And so began a trend of mayors and governors diverting part of their budgets away from the MTA and toward their own priorities. And then blaming one another for the problems that followed. Right. So while the city and state contributions got smaller and smaller and smaller, Subway ridership went up, and so did the fares. But fares still weren't enough to make up for the budget cuts. So, a group of Wall Street executives came to the MTA with a deal. These Wall Street execs, they went to the head of the MTA, also known as the governor, and said, give us your debt. We'll pay you cash, pay us back later. The techie agreed to the deal to refinance the MTA's debt. Basically, they used the Amex to pay off the master. And these bankers, many of whom were donors to Governor Pataki's campaign, walked away with $85 million in commissions and fees. And that debt lives on today. Finally reaches its destination. Even if some of the equipment we're still paying for it does not. Great habitat enhancement for fish and shellfish. Then, fiscal crisis globally. That was a really big turning point for the MTA. Maintenance. Okay, you get through it. A fantastic telling, I think, of a very complex story with a lot of dry history, a lot of stats, but it's a very engaging telling. Um, and then there are very subtle elements to it. The characters at the beginning, we almost got to know them, yet they hardly said anything. Um, the reporter managed to evolve trust between me as a viewer and the interviewees in, in a number of ways. Some shots where you see the interviewee simply staring at the camera, yet you're making a connection even though the person hasn't said anything. Then there was a situation where there was a line of script saying so-and-so was looking for a job and he interjects, no, I got a job. So straight away we have faith in the report because they are even happy to contradict their own reporters. So we, we, we can rely on the information that's being given here. Um, the telling was very visual, very engaging. Uh, now, there was a huge team, I won't show you the credits, but there was a huge production team working on that. Um, you know, it was a major production. The next piece I'm gonna show you is the complete opposite uh, in terms of storytelling. Yet, it's just as compelling. But the reason I want to show it to you is because it strips everything back down to the very, very core of good storytelling. You don't, now that is good storytelling, but you don't need all those gimmicks to tell a good story. Now, what I'd like you to look out for here is the storytelling technique. How does he gain your confidence? How does he get you to believe in what he's saying? Then how does he maintain your engagement throughout the story? And then how does he use very simple body mannerisms? They're substituting the razzmatazz of the graphics and the special effects in the previous one. Just keep an, keep an eye out for those little elements. There was one Tipperay of a young lad when Christie was in his prime. His name was Jimmy Doyle. And of course Christie was the big name when he was growing up. And Jimmy told me himself, he just repeated, when Cork were playing in Thornless, we lived near the stadium. I'd go in to watch Christie Lee. I'd wait till the toss was made to decide which side of the field I'd go on. I'd be on Christie's side. I'd change over to watch for the second game. 
And he told me, even at a very young age, I followed the team down. They just walked to the hotel at the time to see was he the same when he was eating as the other people. And I think Jimmy was disappointed that he was like everyone left. But as a hobbler, Christy Lane was his, his man. And even though Christy was 18 years older than Jimmy, didn't they finish up playing for months together? Jimmy won six All Ireland with Tipperary. But he won, I think, maybe four Railway Cups playing while Christy was playing. And that was something special to him because he was a god to a Tipperary man. Now that's a strange thing. And the first time they played together for Monster, he said, we were staying in the same room in Barry's Hotel. And he said, I was a bit shy, which he was. He was a nice man, Jimmy thought. He went up to the bed area. Christy Ring arrived in about an hour later, carrying a hobby. Didn't say anything to me. Lie down in the bed and sat it hitting the schlitter from wall to wall. Back over Jimmy's head. And he told me I was li as if I was a four year old again. We were both on the monster, but I was watching this. And at a certain stage then, he jumped out of the bed, so the hobby in the ground, he looked over at me and said, I'm ready for tomorrow. Mentally, he was. And Jimmy said, What an honor to go out in the same thing as OK, a very, very simple telling of a story. Um, but the art of storytelling is very strong there. You might, what, did anyone pick up on anything? How did he gain our confidence at the very beginning in telling that story? Can you remember? It's very subtle and it's very simple. It's so subtle you mightn't even notice it because it's such an integral part of storytelling. One temporary young lad when Christy was in his prime. His name was Jimmy Doyle. And of course, Christy was the big name when he was growing up. And Jimmy told me himself, he just repeated. Jimmy told me himself, so, yeah. he used to repeat it. Straight away, we can believe everything Michal is about to say because it's coming from the horse's mouth. And then to reinforce that, he says, he used to repeat it. Very simple, you wouldn't even notice it in the telling, but it's essential to the rest of the story. Um, it, gi it gives it credence. And he, he's a valid source. He is. There's a lot of people not from Ireland here, so just to explain, Christy Ring was a very famous hurler. Hurler, that's right. That's what he's talking about. And he's talking about very Jimmy famous. Doyle, another great hurler, but who, who was a boy going watching. And he thought this man was his idol. When Cork were playing in Thomas, we lived near the stadium. No. That's the second technique he uses. He's after going into the first person, he's become, he's playing Jimmy Doyle. Okay? So straight away, rather than him saying, Jimmy told me he lived next to, to the stadium, he's saying, we lived next to the stadium. So straight away, we're visualizing the little boy because we're listening to his words. I'd go in to watch Christy Ring. I'd wait till the toss was made to decide which side of the field I'd go on. So the subtle gestures, that's what the graphics and the FX were doing in the previous report. But this is being done by simple gestures. But they all subconsciously add to, to how we're receiving the story. I'd be on Christie's side. The second thing he's done there, because of the He's in the first person. He's not calling him Christy Ring, he's calling him Christy. So there's a connection between the boy and, and uh, the, the horror being created in the way he's telling it in the first person. I change over to watch for the second game. And he told me even. And he told me. That's crucial again because straight away he's reinforcing once more this is true. He didn't just continue with the telling of the story. He brought himself back into the scene as a storyteller. You know, he's, he's the conduit and we can, we can trust him. At a very young age, I followed the team down. They just walked to the hotels at the time to see was he the same when he was eating as the other people. 
And I think Jimmy was disappointed that he was like everyone then. But as a hodler, Christy Lane was his, his man. So what he's done here is it's a very old tradition. It's it's part of the the the, the storytelling of the hero. He has created it. He's, he's, he's built him up to be a hero like Finn McCool or Coe Holland or any of these uh, great heroes of the tradition so uh, was his man again it's personal and even though Christie was 18 years older than Jimmy didn't they finish up playing for months together Jimmy won six all Ireland with Tipperary but he won I think maybe four railway cups playing while Christie was playing Oh, that's the information. And that was something special. And this is where he lifts the story he was a again God once more. To a Tipperary man. Now, that's a, a bit of humour there. A, a Tipperary man being a God to a cart man. And this is where he picks up the story then. Just and the first the time they played together for Monster, he said, he said, we were staying in the same room in Barry's Hotel. And he said, I was a bit shy, which he was. He was a nice man, Jimmy Dodd. So that was very important well, there, the that interjection. In the middle of the story, he said, I was a bit shy, which he was. He was a nice man, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Doyle. What does that do? And kind of paints a picture of the character. Yeah, yeah but it, 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 that and it also reinforces Michal's familiarity or connection with Jimmy Doyle in that he kn knew him well. So it adds credibility. E extra credibility to his telling of the story. It is. Christy Ring arrived in about an hour later carrying a hog me. Didn't say anything to me. So he got into first person here again. Lie down in the bed and started hitting the schlitter from wall. So we're in the room now with the storyteller watching this. And he told me I was like, as if I was a four year old again. So the, the reason I wanted to show you that, a simple story, if you actually sit down and analyze every section of it, there's a technique, a method, and and a lot of it is, is quite subtle and in, in compiling your own stories be they in, for print or, or for video or for online content whether it's blogging or whatever I think it's really important to kind of be aware of the importance of subtleties and that you actually need to really really think about how you're going to forge your story and how, how you're going to, to mould it in terms of structure, but also in terms of how you emotionally connect with, with your audience. Um, so there are different ways to connect. You, you might use a line of script, you might use natural sound, or you might use traditional storytelling techniques. It's very, it's, it's strange in, in the sense that, you know, from my own background in folklore, and looking at some of my own reports, I, I, I didn't no realize it for a long while, until I actually started dissecting the way I was putting reports together and I was drawing a lot from traditional storytelling. For example, the use of things in threes. That's a big thing in traditional Irish storytelling. You know, everything happens three times. You know, uh, Phil McCool eats a feast three times and they go on an epic voyage three times. Subconsciously, the number three and the, 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 the eventualities in threes appeal to us somehow, I don't know why, but even look at uh, titles. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, good, bad and the ugly. There's a ring to it, there's a rhythm to things in trees. The same thing happens with audio. Um, I'll just show you how I might incorporate that into a package. So quite often I might do it maybe at the top of a package. So I'd, I'd uh, maybe use three, three snippets of natural sound, natural audio and interject it with three short lines of script. So what you end up doing is creating a rhythm at the very top of the package that helps grab the attention of the viewer, but also sets the tone for the rest of the report. So I have one on gliding on inch beach where I use that, but rather I, I, I interject it with script and kind of semi-interviews, you could call them. They're just stuff people are saying naturally rather than full-on interviews. Now I think there's one snip that's taken out of an interview, but I use it to build a rhythm and then there's a shot of the, the plane taking off and that's, we're into the report then. So it's kind of a bum, 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 bum and away we go.